Hi, everybody. I think I am going to talk into this because I don't want to strain my voice. I just got back from a, a meetup tour of Europe like yesterday, so, uh, and uh, uh, my company got bought by Red Hat while I was in Europe, so. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not sure how awesome this deck is going to be. I think it's okay. Uh, uh, feel free to ask questions because uh, I'm really just sort of, you know, talking about what users of Ansible tell us about how Ansible is being used in the container world. And this, uh, this little deck is sort of my best uh, effort at putting together those rationales and sort of uh, explaining uh, a theory of... Uh, how uh, configuration management and orchestration tools are going to look in a new uh, container-based world. Uh, so a little about, about me. My name is Greg de Koenigsberg. Uh, I'm the, I got, I'm gonna have to figure out how to say this. I, I am technically still, I think, the VP of community at Ansible, a wholly owned Red Hat subsidiary. Uh, so I think that's the right verbiage for now. Next week it'll probably change. Uh, been doing this stuff for a while. I've been with Ansible for a couple of years. I was with a uh, cloud provider, Eucalyptus, before that. And before that, I spent uh, about 10 years at Red Hat. So uh, back to the future, hello to all my old friends. Um, so hands up, how many people uh, are actual Ansible users here? OK, that's a good chunk. Uh, and good enough that I don't feel bad about glossing over some of the Ansible basics. Uh, so if some of you don't know anything about Ansible, I'll touch on it briefly, but if you have any questions, uh, you, can, you can find me after and, uh, and, and I can give you the basic pitch. Um, so uh, I go to a lot of DevOps conferences, and the first thing that people uh, ask at a DevOps conference is, well, what do you think DevOps means? And that's a really tiresome question. Uh, I sort of have some notion in my head of what dev means and what ops means, and sort of DevOps is like maybe you guys can work together and not be mad at each other all the time and stuff. That's sort of what DevOps feels like to me. And for me, it's a simple definition. Uh, the devs are the folks who get it running, and the ops are the folks who keep it running, right? It's sort of the simplest uh, 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 definition I can come up with. Uh, so, uh, the dev world has, it seems like, been recently conquered by Docker. Uh, lots of dev folks are just in love with it uh, because it makes their lives easier, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, and ops folks uh, are starting to love Ansible for uh, the same fundamental reasons, the same reasons that everybody loves a tool because it makes their life easier. So, uh, and these are two sort of, uh, uh, viewpoints that come at problems from different directions, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, so why are devs in love with Docker? Three basic reasons. Uh, immutability. That means that you can build an item and deploy that item somewhere and know that that item is not going to change. And for people who have been spending many years figuring out things like uh, RPM dependency management, uh, and random configuration changes uh, when your server checks in and some file has changed somewhere and suddenly all of your applications are broken. Immutability seems like a really good idea for a lot of people. Uh, and the promise of immutability, it's not always the, you know, uh, the, the reality, but the promise of immutability is very compelling and it's one of the reasons that uh, the developers are moving strongly towards Docker. Uh, immutability also implies portability uh, if you have your environment set up properly. Because there's nothing in the container that's going to change and all of the configuration is managed outside of the container, what that implies is that the thing you have that you are moving around is portable and will work ideally just as well on your uh, laptop as it would in your CI environment as it would in production assuming that you have all of the infrastructure around it correct. And that's another theme we'll be coming back to. Uh, and then scalability. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole uh, sort of background of containers uh, uh, is that every, the container is using the same OS space over and over and over again. And so any new container is really just the delta 
uh, of what's uh, new for that container to run. And so what that means is that a container can re be represented in a very small amount of bits, the difference between the underlying OS and what's unique to the container. And so you can fit a lot more running containers into an environment than you can for VMs. So uh, that gives you sort of hyperscalability in a way that VMs don't. VMs are the entire OS, and the entire OS is copied however many times onto that system until there's no more memory. With Docker or other containers, you can have lots and lots and lots more instances. So sort of in short, that is why containers in general are interesting and why Docker in particular is interesting. Containers have, not, have been around for a while, to be clear. Uh, it was always possible to do this kind of stuff, but Docker, uh, and this will be a theme today, Docker made all of that stuff easier. That's why Docker is successful right now, right? Uh, how many people here have used uh, change routes, right, change routes? Okay, how many people have used FreeBSD jails? Wow, some twisted people. How many Solera zones? Right, so we all know, we all know that Docker is not magical. We have been using these things. We, you know, we've used LXC for various reasons. You know, we, we, we sort of know what the background is. But it was only a small subset of people in IT who had enough knowledge at the right time to be able to take those technologies, figure out how they worked, and put them to best use, okay? The interesting thing about Docker is not that Docker in and of itself is all that special. It just makes all of it easier. It makes it easier to create a container image. It makes it easy to run that container in an environment. It makes it easy to scale all that stuff. And it's just a little bit of tooling in the right places that takes this thing that people have been using for a long time and suddenly makes it appear to be revolutionary. All right? does that make sense? So it's very interesting that Ansible is largely the same way, just from a different direction, okay? So uh, here's the quick pitch on Ansible for people who don't uh, know much about Ansible. Ansible is uh, basically a tool that can run SSH on a bunch of boxes uh, at one time. Sorry. Maybe it'll stay put this time. Okay. Uh, uh, so Ansible is basically distributed SSH with modules and idempotence. That's what Ansible is. Okay. Uh, it is used as a configuration management tool and also as an orchestration tool. There are many other configuration management tools. There are other uh, orchestration uh, tools. Uh, Ansible makes it all easier, does it all at once. Because it runs on SSH, there's no bootstrapping necessary. Uh, any machine that has SSH on it can be managed by Ansible. Okay? So that means pretty much any OS from the past 20 years uh, that's Unix or Linux based. Lots of other things like network switches. People can, if you were here for the previous session, for the Cumulus session, you know that people are using Ansible to manage Cumulus and other networking hardware. Uh, so it's a, it's a broad tool that doesn't require bootstrapping. Uh, no central server is required. In traditional configuration management, the way it works is uh, you put an agent on your system, and that system has to check into a central server to figure out what its configuration is. Hi, I'm a web server. My, definition, my, you know, my configuration is defined on this central server, and I'll keep asking that server over and over again if I've changed or if I'm the same. And it can be very magical. You can just make a central change, and then all of your machines will check in and have the right configuration. But that means that you have to have a server properly configured in the center of all of it. And you have to have that server even to get started. Because Ansible doesn't require an agent and doesn't require a central server, uh, it's just much easier for people to get started with. Uh, because it's SSH-based, it's push, not pull. So there's no agents that are checking in. If you want to make changes to a bunch of systems, you actually have to run those changes from somewhere. Here, I want to manage these 50 uh, web servers. I want to update the software that's on them, run Ansible Playbook, uh, update my web servers, and do all that kind of stuff, dot YAML. And then it magically goes and talks to the 50 servers and does the right thing. Uh, because it's written in YAML, 
Uh, the playbooks in Ansible are YAML. They're easy to read. They're easy to maintain. Uh, you know, I could go over a bunch of Ansible examples, but again, that's not why I'm here. If you want to ask more about that, we can talk more about that later. Um, and again, configuration management and orchestration, these are tools that have been out there for years, but Ansible is the tool that is getting a very fast mass adoption because it's the easiest. Uh, it it's, doesn't take a lot of understanding. You can be up and running with your first Ansible playbook in an hour. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it lowers the bar. In the same way that Docker lowered the bar for, con for containers uh, in the dev world, uh, Ansible lowers the bar for configuration management and orchestration in the ops world. Okay? So that's why Ansible is interesting. And that's why Red Hat was interested in Ansible. So the common um, uh, uh, enemy of devs and ops is complexity. Uh, you know, you can simplify uh, the uh, containerization and make that as easy as possible. You can simplify the configuration management orchestration, make that as simple as possible. But in the end, you're still going to be managing complexity. If you need these tools and you expect to get the most out of them, it's because you are planning to do things at scale, right? If you're not managing a bunch of systems, you don't necessarily even need containers and you don't need configuration management because you can manage it all by hand and manage a few changes here and there. But when you want to get to hyperscale, you must use these kinds of tools. And the only way to, to, to get to that sort of hyperscale future is to make sure you're using tools that are the right tool for the job and that people in your organization understand how to use, okay? So uh, I'm making the assumption here that you know, people who are in this talk sort of understand why containers are a big deal and are starting that process of moving a bunch of stuff to containers. So let's start with that as sort of the, the baseline. There's two, there's, so I look at this as a continuum, right? Uh, people use containers for all kinds of reasons. They might be good reasons, they might be bad reasons. They use containers, so there's an old P.T. Barnum expression, nothing draws a crowd like a crowd, right? And the crowd has moved towards containers, so everyone's like, oh, containers are amazing, I'm gonna use containers. Well, what are you gonna use them for? I'm not sure, but something, and it's gonna be great, okay? Um, and so there's various different use cases, and I, and I think that they all fall along this rough spectrum. On the one side is the container as mini virtual machine, okay? Uh, they've, they've used virtual machines. They may just have actually figured out how to use virtual machines. And containers look an awful lot like virtual machines to someone who doesn't really understand the differences. So uh, these people will take this mini VM. They will treat it exactly like a server, which means that they will put an SSH agent uh, an, an SSH server on it, and they will SSH into this container, which you know, the container purists will say, no, no, that's completely wrong, but it's still allowable, so people do it, because it makes it easier for them to treat it like a server. Uh, they don't care so much about the immutability aspect, because they don't necessarily understand why that's important. They just know that it saves them a bunch of space, as opposed to a traditional VM, so they'll make this server image, and then when they need to change the server image, they won't actually go create a new image and, and put everything in it and then move it over. They'll just SSH right into the container and treat it like it's a VM. And they'll make changes in place and they'll run configuration tools on it. Uh, they'll configure it where it is instead of doing uh, a proper uh, configuration by building that stuff into the images. Uh, and that's okay. Right? That's okay, because it takes a while to understand how containers work, and if people want to start by treating them like mini VMs, that's fine. It's the simplest way in. People can understand sort of what they're doing. They can start to learn about some of the issues of containers. Well, wait a minute, what, where does the logging go on these things? And well, how do I do shared storage? Because when I store things in this container and then this container goes away, my data goes away. Um, but it gives them a starting point. But it is monolithic, right? It's taking a lot of the ideas around containers and just ignoring them and treating it as a monolithic thing, okay? And there are various uh, sort of ways that people can move towards the fully distributed notion of a container as a microservice. So how many people know what I say when I say microservice? Okay, so a good chunk. 
How many are running fully formed microservices in production? So a handful, but not that many yet. Okay? And the reason that not that many are running this stuff in production is because completely changing the way you do engineering to accommodate a true microservice architecture is not easy. There's a lot of stuff that you have to learn and figure out. First of all, every container ideally contains one service that does one thing well. That is the goal of microservices, right? Which means that if you have this gigantic monolithic application stack, you have to figure out how to break all these things and put them listening on little ports and make sure that they've got uh, 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 you know, uh, an, an API uh, that's talking JSON and all the resty kind of stuff. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got port management figured out. Uh, and at scale, it's not that easy a thing. A lot of people are happy running containers on their laptop because it's real easy to set up containers on your laptop. But when it comes to moving into a production environment where you have to manage a lot of containers, it's not that clear how to proceed in a lot of cases. And you have to get a lot of domain knowledge to figure out how it works. Right? Yes, you get immutability. You get all those things. Uh, ideally, you're using something like etcd to give yourself a zero-conf environment where uh, you know, in, uh, a configuration is inherited from the etcd server. Uh, but you have to figure out how to set all that stuff up, and it's a steep learning curve. And you then have all of the characteristics of a fully distributed system, right? So monolithic versus distributed. So when you're dealing with complexity, there's equal amounts of complexity in a monolithic system as there are in a distributed system. It's just that those complexities live in different places, OK? Uh, uh, in, in a monolithic uh, stack, all of the complexity is in each one of these systems that you're managing. And it's why configuration management became popular. Because I've got this gigantic stack. It's full of software. There's a database. There's a, uh, a web server. Uh, there's a proxy server. Maybe someone threw in a NoSQL server. And they're sort of all living on the same box. Or maybe they're spread out to two or three boxes. And the relationships between them are very clear, right? This is the web server. It lives here. This is the database server. It lives here. And the web server talks to the database server on this port. Those are all configuration options. And those configura configuration options can be managed by configuration management tools, right? So complexity in the days where configuration management was central was managed by configuration management tools, OK? But in the distributed world, the notion is that all of the configuration is already baked into the image. The image and, the, and the, the service that starts from that image, it does what it does. It does one thing really well. It doesn't care what uh, port it's listening on. It just goes to etcd or some common configuration and learns everything about itself through service discovery. You know, it basically says, hi, I'm a new uh, image, and I run this service. Tell me all about this service. What ports do I talk to? What network boundaries do I need to cross? What, how, where do I store things? Where do I log things? OK, I know that stuff great. I know how to process all that. Very clear boundaries, very clear inputs and outputs. And when the system works well, it works well. But the problem is that you've moved the complexity. The complexity is no longer a property of the thing. The complexity is now a property of the relationship between all of your things. And the more things you have as you scale, the more complexity you have as you scale. It's just that it's a different kind of complexity. And people who are trying to get to that end point are now starting to realize that there is a lot of complexity that they had sort of thought they got away from. No, it just moved to somewhere else. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about how Ansible is used in these different environments. And then I'm basically just going to sort of throw up my hands and say, OK, I'm done. And we're going to have a, a Q&A. Uh, and maybe we'll all leave for beers early. I don't know. Um, so how is Ansible used in the container as VM? Well, it's very straightforward. You're not really treating the container uh, as a, a new thing. You're just treating it as a VM. And so the Ansible management tools all work exactly the same way. If you want to. Uh, you know, you've got your traditional client-server application structure. 
Uh, you've got your dev stage prod life cycle, right? Everybody who's done uh, software development from the old school knows that uh, you know, before there was this thing called continuous integration, you had different environments. And the biggest pain in your ass was keeping those environments anywhere near close to in sync so that when you installed something on dev and you installed something on prod, you just prayed that they looked anything alike by the time they got from one end to the other, right? That's the value of, the, the value of configuration management tools because uh, suddenly you could have configuration as code and you could say, uh, you know, I'm going to deploy all of these applications and there's going to be this handful of variables that are tracked centrally in version control, right? I've got, uh, we've got a Git repo, the entire team uses it. These are the IP addresses for uh, uh, staging and for uh, the dev environments and for production. And when you want to download something to run on your machine, you just change the appropriate variables and make sure that that's right. And so instead of hard coding things, you know, and we've all run into that thing where we hard coded a variable and then forgot it was hard coded and then something went down and spent six hours looking for it. That's what traditional configuration management helps you to get away from. And that's what Ansible does in these minimal cases of containers where people are still doing that. Because what's happening a lot is that people are using Docker for their laptops because, hey, I'm going to learn Docker and I'm going to set this up cool. They don't have an integration environment that does Docker, and they certainly don't have a production environment that uses Docker. So what you need then is some mechanism to deploy the same code into those various places using the standard configuration methodology. And Ansible is a great and simple tool for that. And if you Google using Ansible with Docker, that's a lot of, that's a lot of what you're going to see. People say, well, the first thing you do is put an SSH uh, uh, daemon on your container. Okay, but that's not how it's supposed to be, but okay. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of FUD in the configuration management space that, uh, oh, uh, configuration management's going to go away when Docker is, is, is ready to go. Uh, and, and, you know, the reason is because these things are doing zero conf and you don't need to, you don't need to manage anything anymore. Well, that's true in a way, but also completely wrong in a way. Right? The way that it's true is that you're moving what you're configuring. So if you have a bunch of containers in your farm, a bunch of microservices, and you've done the perfect, and we're all the way at the other end of the, the continuum now, right? We're assuming perfect conf uh, 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 container microservice-based nirvana, okay? So, uh, you've got uh, all of your container OSs out there using something like core OS to make sure that you've got the minimum possible uh, surface area for the container that you're running. Uh, you've got uh, uh, true zero comp achieved with, with uh, one of the service discovery tools like etcd or console or zookeeper. Uh, and you're doing full fleet management so when you're spinning up new containers, you're doing it with one of the new hotness things like Kubernetes or fleet. Um, and, and not only that, but you're not worrying about dev test prod in the same way because you're doing continuous integration and continuous delivery with something like Jenkins where anytime you make a check into the code, it goes automatically to some uh, environment that is configured the same way using containers and etcd as your production environment is. And managing all of that is simply a matter of managing the configuration variables that are in etcd, right? Uh, and there are a different set of variables in the different environments. That's supposed to be nirvana. Uh, and you would think that you wouldn't need any Ansible for any of this. But as it turns out, you need even more Ansible for this because now you're managing things on a bunch of different hosts uh, that have to underlie things, right? Because it still turtles all the way down. You still have to have an OS that does something somewhere, right? No matter how magical the containers are, they run on things. Uh, and Everything that isn't Docker has to be managed by something. So I think it's interesting that a lot of people in the sort of broader Docker community are starting to turn to Ansible as the tool that they use to manage the infrastructure around all this stuff. So uh, I think I neglected to actually uh, turn on my uh, wireless, so I was going to link to one of these, but I'll just make this slide deck available and you can go take a look. Uh, in the meantime, uh, so all of these services that I just talked about, all of them have prominent and well-used Ansible roles to set up the supporting infrastructure. 
right? So, uh, and some interesting names here, right? Uh, Jive, uh, the, the folks at Jive Software are the ones who wrote the, the role uh, that's predominantly used for setting up console using Ansible. Uh, the fleet stuff is being uh, written by VMware. Uh, e. Paris happens to be a guy working at Red Hat, so there's a lot of interesting uh, Kubernetes configuration stuff going on using Ansible. Um, uh, and, and all of the users I talk to all of the time who are using Ansible for uh, building out the infrastructure that they're going to be running their container infrastructure in. And again, why is this? Because what we're coming back to is the notion that you can't just get rid of complexity. You can simply move it to where it makes more sense, if possible, right? Developers don't want to know about infrastructure. They want to write their application and make sure that application works, right? And ops folks don't want to know about the, the application. What they want to know is the basic amount of information that they want to know about uh, the development environment, and then the operations stuff they want to handle. Okay, so devs are winning on the uh, the, the Docker side. I'm sorry, Docker is winning on the dev side. Ansible is doing very well in the ops side, and increasingly we're seeing these two tools used together in such a way that everybody can uh, can work together, and the separation takes place in the right place, and dev folks are responsible for doing what they do, and they use primarily Docker to do it, and ops folks are responsible for doing what they do, and they're primarily using Ansible to do it. So that's it. That's the high level. Uh, yes, clap. I'm, it's so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Academy. And um, uh, uh, so uh, I'm happy to take questions. Or I'm happy to get out. We have a question, so we can't get out yet. Yes. So the question is, I'm new to Ansible. How do you, if you're not doing this from a central configuration management tool, which does things all at the same time, how do you make sure that you're keeping things in sync with Ansible? And my answer would be Cronworks. So uh, Ansible is designed to be a Linux tool that works in the tradition of Unix tools. You don't need necessarily a fancy scheduling mechanism. You just need to decide, which machines do I want to make sure are updated at the same time? OK, I'm going to use Ansible to update them at the same time. The fundamental uh, primitives of Ansible are the playbook, which is what you do, and the inventory, which is where you do it. So you can have all kinds of different inventories, and you specify different sets of machines to push different playbooks to. Right? So the syntax is basically simplifies, simplified. Ansible playbook, run this playbook on this inventory, go. Okay? And the way that Ansible works, it runs. So Ansible uh, lays out a series of tasks in YAML, which is very human readable. And so it might be task one, update the, the web server packages. Task two, uh, uh, touch the database over here. Uh, task three, restart the web server. Uh, task four, do a ping to the web server with an assert statement to make sure that it's actually up, uh, and then we're done. And the way Ansible works by default is it does all of those steps in parallel on all of the machines at the same time until they've all reached the same state, right? So you would say, update all the packages on the web servers, Okay, we're done. We're waiting on server number 10 because it's got a really slow connection. Okay, it's done. Step two, do the same thing. Okay, that's done. Step three, now we're waiting on server one because something's weird. We're going to do it. Okay, now it's done. Right? So that's basically how it works. Answer your question? If you add 10 more nodes later, you just do one more. If you add 10 more, and so this is where idempotence comes in, which is sort of classic configuration management. Uh, An idempotent uh, operation is one where f of x equals f of f of x, right? So if you do it one time or you do it a bunch of times, the result will always be the same. And the nice thing about uh, uh, you know, all of the configuration management tools, and Ansible is the same, is that you can run the same operation over and over on 100 systems. And if you're only changing the 10 systems at the end, the first 90 will very quickly give you a no-op. Nothing needs to be done. This is still good. We're done. And so. Uh, if you want to manage a large fleet, you basically just keep running Ansible, and it will only update the systems that it needs to update.
Are we done? You can ask me questions. I'm not actually trying to hustle you out of here, but I don't want you to feel obliged either, because I'll be around uh, you know, if you want to talk later. No, we're good? All right, thanks everybody.